Hi, I'm Olivia Mattis, and I'm delighted to welcome you today on behalf of the Susan Mendes Foundation for a story about yet another unsung hero. Today we're focusing on a Jewish hero. His name was Wilfred Israel. And learning his story was a revelation to me. I didn't know about him. And perhaps for you as well. As you may know, we've done numerous programs on the kinder transport story. We focused on Nicholas Winton. We showed the film Into the Arms of Strangers and other films that were related to the kinder transport story. But our hero today, Wilfred Israel, is never mentioned in these films, even though he was fundamental to the establishment of the entire kinder transport program. And that alone should put him into the annals of history. So today we have a moderator, and that is my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Judd Newborn. He will introduce our speakers, but before he does so, he will give just a brief overview of Wilfred Israel, who he was and his importance. So Judd, please take the floor. My pleasure, Olivia. As you said, we're presenting a neglected story of extraordinary self-sacrifice, daring and accomplishment. It's a revelation in the annals of rescue and human nobility. We have three important guests today who've helped rescue the story itself from oblivion. But before I introduce them, let's establish a timeline of Wilfred Israel's life and actions for the sake of clarity. Okay, Wilfred Israel was born in 1899 in London to a prominent Jewish family. His mother was British and his father German. In 1918, he starts working with Quakers after World War I to relieve starvation in Russia and Germany. In the late 1920s, he begins to work at the family-owned business in Berlin, the N. Israel Department Store. Between 1933 and 1943, he works to help thousands of German Jews to escape Germany to the United Kingdom. He is the essential link, in fact, in establishing the Kinder Transport Program and is engaged in the Youth Aliyah movement as well. In 1943, he was killed in an air attack by the German Luftwaffe. So um, before I uh, go for, we meet our guests, let me introduce them. Our first guest will be Naomi Shepard, the London-based author of the compelling and definitive biography, Wilfred Israel, German Jewry's secret ambassador. It's available, uh, from Amazon as an ebook. It's also out in Hebrew and in uh, German and other languages. Educated at Oxford University, Naomi Shepard served as the Israel correspondent for the New Statesman and as well as The Guardian, The New York Times, and Commentary, among other leading publications. Her many books include A Price Below Rubies, Jewish Women as Rebels and Radicals, also The Zealous Intruders, The Western Rediscovery of Palestine, and The Russians in Israel, and there are more. Our second guest will be Dr. Ilan Baer, who is featured in Yonatan Nir's documentary, which you've seen, along with his brother Ophir. Their father, Uri Baer, was a friend of Wilfred Israel in Kibbutz Hatzoria populated by many of those refugees Wilfred Israel rescued. Uri Baer created a special museum there devoted to documenting Wilfred's heroic wartime activism and housing his valuable Oriental art collection. Ilan Baer, the son, is a physician who serves on the Bnei B'rith Committee that honors Jewish rescuers of Jews. Our third guest is the award-winning Israeli filmmaker Yonatan Nir himself director of the documentary you've seen, The Essential Link, The Story of Wilfred Israel. Yonatan Nir is a master storyteller and epic photojournalist who has created numerous films. His works include the critically acclaimed Dolphin Boy, acquired by Disney Pictures, in which he captures the unique relationship formed between humans and nature. He is a sought after international speaker with venues that have included the United Nations and TEDx. Okay. Let's start now with Naomi Shepard 
and two questions I'd like to pose. Naomi, why haven't we known more about Wilfred Israel before? And why is his story so important to remember and tell to others? Naomi? Thank you very much. Uh, Wilfred Israel had two aims. One was to inform the British government and through them the world of uh, the Nazi persecution of the Jews from the very moment of Hitler's accession to power in 1933. Um, he also tried to urge the British government to intervene, at least to protest what was happening to the Jews. And secondly, he helped Jews leave Germany uh, participated in the work of the Hilfsverein, the German Jewish Emigration Organization, first of all from 1937, and then later after the notorious Kristallnacht, uh, he took on practically the entire work of the Hilfsverein. Uh, both of these uh, activities have never really been celebrated for a very simple reason. First of all, uh, the British archives were closed for 30 years after the Nazi period. And even after that, not all the files, the British documents were open. Secondly, uh, it was only much, much later that it was understood that Jews were working to help themselves to organize their own rescue. Um, so a, map, a lot of the evidence was hidden for many, many years. And uh, only quite accidentally did I come upon uh, the story of Wilfred Israel. Now, uh, the problem with uh, investigating this is that Wilfred Israel had no official job uh, in uh, Jewish organizations in Germany. But uh, he was important for three reasons. First of all, um, because he was heir to five generations of German businessmen. The first, it was the first. Uh, business to be opened in Germany under, uh, under Jewish uh, leadership, and it was the last to, to close. Uh, also, because of his, uh, his English collection, uh, connection, which you've mentioned, uh, he had access to the whole of the elite German, uh, Jewish, uh, British uh, community, first and foremost to Lord Samuel, who was the, uh, a minister in the British government, later High Commissioner in Palestine. And uh, not only Samuel, but he knew many other British politicians because of the wide range of friendships and uh, interests that he had. He was known throughout Europe, obviously in the business community as well. On the other hand, because he had no official role, uh, several things prevented him, his work uh, of rescue to be known. Uh, first of all, Wilfred Israel was not a conventional German Jew. He was a pacifist when most German Jews were ardent patriots, served in the First World War. In fact, his, his British and his German uh, relations were, in fact, as it were, fighting one another, something also which made him a pacifist. Secondly, he was a socialist, uh, very unusual for a businessman. Uh, and thirdly, he had Zionist sympathies at a time when the Zionist movement in Germany was uh, very small, 25,000 uh, members out of half a million uh, community. Um, so uh, 
he was not the obvious choice to represent German Jewry. Uh, however, he was also the obvious choice to put him in danger with the Nazis. And he was, uh, you will uh, have seen from Jonathan's film, that he was arrested together with the young men of the Bertloider. But uh, that was only one of his arrests. He was arrested, first of all, as a pacifist at the little anti-war museum, whose director was a friend of his. He was arrested as uh, a Jewish businessman together with his, uh, with his brother and other leaders uh, of the firm. And he was arrested, as you saw, with the Werkleuter, who were both Zionists and socialists. Um, so uh, he was in danger, continual danger. And that was another reason, apart from the absence of uh, official documents, that was another reason why uh, he maintained the utmost secrecy throughout all his work. Um, we, we don't know exactly how he got the information which helped him. Um, we know that he was, uh, he was in contact with uh, Hubert Polak, who figures in the film, um, who uh, kept his uh, vow of secrecy even after Wilfred Israel's death. But we know that he managed to warn many people um, that they were on a list for arrest. And that meant uh, Jews and also non-Jews. Um, and here we have a clue. There were many Nazis in the firm who he could not sack. But the most important one was a man called Kurt Liepert, who was the head of the Works Committee. In other words, um, probably the most important employee. And Kurt Liepert, we know, informed him, uh, most dramatically informed him of the Kristallnacht. How did he do that? Uh, Wilfred Israel uh, was warned by Liepert not to open the doors of the firm, to pull down the shutters on the next day. And Wilfred understood this and immediately cabled the British government that a terrible pogrom was going to happen the next day. Strangely enough, he did not take Liepert's advice. He did not uh, closed the firm, and as you know, it was ransacked together with all the other Jewish businessmen, uh, business firms. I assume the reason was that he had also, from, uh, from different sources, been promised that the firm would be spared. On that occasion, his uh, information was, was dual, and it was faulty. But uh, that was simply the most dramatic of his many representations in secret at danger to himself. Now, uh, when, when I came to, uh, to try to understand Wilfred Israel's life, it was completely accidental. I had read about him in a, a book review. Uh, this was connected with uh, uh, Christopher Isherwood's portrait of him in Goodbye to Berlin. And uh, one of my uh, parents' friends, Hans Fell, uh, was a German uh, Jewish film uh, journalist who knew Wilfred very well. But that was all I had. But since I was living in Israel, I recognized the name Wilfred Israel. How? because I had seen week after week an advertisement for the Wilfred Israel Museum. I had no idea what it was, but I went there. And, uh, and there something extraordinary happened. Uh, the, as you all have heard and seen in the film, 
uh, the founders of Hazarea, who had been arrested with Wilfred and who remained in contact with him. He visited Palestine and the kibbutz several times. They had never asked, uh, never told their children exactly what had happened, their arrest and the friendship. And I don't know how much they knew of Wilfred Israel's other work, but certainly uh, they were uh, silent. They said nothing. And I was a catalyst. I came along an outsider um, knowing absolutely nothing about Wilfred Israel. And they opened up. They spoke and spoke and described to me everything they knew. They showed me the kibbutz archive where there were letters from Wilfred and uh, mention of Foley. I was able to uh, get confirmation from the British intelligence service of whom he was. He's now very, very famous as one of the writers Gentiles, but at the time, no, back in the 1980s, he certainly wasn't known. Uh, and so uh, I owe Azariah uh, the entry to the story of Wilfred Israel. Otherwise, he would have been totally forgotten. That's how the kibbutz comes in there. Um, now, the question of, of why we should remember Wilfred Israel, well, first of all, the thousands and thousands whom he rescued, uh, not only the kinder transport, through his cooperation with, uh, with the Quakers, whom he'd worked with since his early youth, um, but uh, also uh, everything that he had done uh, with uh, various organizations, also from, from the uh, from the 1920s. Um, he, uh, he should be remembered also for the fact that he managed to convince the British to set up work camps for men uh, released, young men released from the concentration camps after the Kinderdraft, after the uh, Kristallnacht. Uh, and of course, there are the countless people who he saved through the Hilserai, the emigration office. Um, but I think finally, uh, the reason why he should be remembered is that today we have uh, throughout the world a terrible refugee problem from Iraq, from Syria, uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, we have uh, now the refugees from the Ukraine, and most latterly from Sudan. And uh, the countries of the West are reluctant to admit them, just as they were reluctant to admit Jews, penniless Jews, in the 1930s. Uh, Wilfred Israel was bitter about his lack of uh, ability to uh, to arouse what he called the conscience of the world. Uh, today we have a huge problem of the conscience of the world, which doesn't seem to be operating at all. And the whole question of asylum, which was paramount for Wilfred Israel, to get the, the countries of the West to admit refugees persecuted, this problem exists today in the same measure and since Wilfred Israel was responsible not only for rescuing Jews, but for those who, uh, non-Jews who opposed Hitler, he was uh, in contact with Protestant uh, clergy who were also uh, opponents of Hitler. And he was a friend of uh, Adam von Trott, who was one of the conspirators uh, who was hanged after the attempt on Hitler's life failed in, 19, in 1944. So uh, I think this is important, that Wilfred Israel was a world figure, not only a figure in Jewish rescue, but a, a figure of world importance. And his, uh, his activities should inspire others today. Thank you, that's it. Um, and now, 
pass it to uh, Ilan Bear, who uh, was the son, as we've heard, of one of Wilfrid's friends, founders of the Kibbutz. And uh, he will tell us more about the way in which the Kibbutz is commemorating Wilfred Israel's life. It's a great honor to speak to many people in the USA and in Israel and wherever about this, about this brave and noble man, Wilfred. And I would like first to say, or to explain why I specifically have the honor to talk about him. As was said already, I heard a lot about Wilfred from my father, Uri Bear, who was a close friend of him. But he was not only a close friend of him, but he also went to Israel at 1933 as a pioneer of the group of the Weltleute to set uh, the conditions for the Kibbutz Foundation. And he was already an art history doctor, which he studied in Germany. <clears throat> and of course, he thought this would be left behind him in Germany, and he went to be a chalutz, a pioneer, an agriculture worker in the field. And he thought what he studied about uh, out of history would, would stay be behind in, in Germany. But when happened what happened with Israel and he was killed, and in his will, he gave the kibbutz a precious uh, art collection from the Far East and also from the Near East. Then after the kibbutz decided to accept the will, my father as an, as an art doctor became the head of the group who built the museum and who managed and operated the museum for many, many years. And I did hear from my, father's, from my father a lot about him. Of course, he didn't know so much as Nomi uh, told us later in her book in the very, very detailed biography. And when I read the biography, I asked my father, how much of it did you know before this book? And he told me we knew only little of it, a lot of details and facts that Nomi describes in this book. They did not know, but they knew the main thing that he was very de dedicated to saving, very dedicated and very active in saving uh, Jews from, from uh, Germany and later from other countries too, and with an emphasis on youngers and children, maybe emotionally, maybe because he thought or understood that the new state of Israel, they will be more needed, the youngers. And that I heard a lot from my father about him. I cannot say, I just go with it. That's why I am talking something about Wilfred in this panel. Uh, the second point I would like to emphasize is two, two facts that were very shortly already mentioned, but I would like to, to emphasize, emphasize why, why was Wilfred so dedicated to this uh, saving and to this philanthropic um, help to the Jewish. Also, already as a very young man, 19 years old, after the, at the end of the First World War, it was mentioned there was a very terrible starvation in Russia that millions were starving to death because of the results of the, the war and also in Germany. He was already then years before the Nazis, he was already participated in those uh, philanthropic actions with some known people like uh, Nansen and like Elizabeth Rotten and others, and with organizations of philanthropic help 
wherever there was misery and suffering. So it was in his character from very young age before the Nazis. And I think this shows how it led him later when the Nazis came to control and, and uh, developed and uh, started with the persecutions of the Jews. It was so to call natural to his attitude and character to be very active in saving lives. The third point that I would like to, to say about him is that he, he was very dedicated to save as many lives as possible, also in the direction of Israel, of the Zionism, and also to any other place in the world that would accept them. And there was a controversy in the Zionist different organization, and especially in the main one, the Jewish agency, whether to put all the effort, money, and connections only to the directions, direction to Israel or to every place. And Ben Gurion, then, and then already an important uh, figure in the Jewish ag agency, and later the first prime minister of Israel and declared the state, he was especially, a, he was in the direction only to save to Israel, because he said somewhere, if they will go anywhere else, Sooner or later, they will have the same problem. And so we have to put all our efforts to bring Jews only to Israel with all the problems of the Arabs and the, the English. Uh, that it was not uh, possible for, for every, everyone and so on. And Wilfried was, Wilfried did it both sides and the two, I think, great um, examples are the youth Aliyah, the emigration of younger and youth to Israel, which he was very active in it from the beginning and later. And from the other side, the kinder transport that was saving thousands of children to England. And we speak only of those very, very big number of um, <clears throat> examples, but he helped many, 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 many others to, to, to emigrate to many other places in the world wherever they were uh, ready to accept them. Thank you. Thank you, Ilan. And um, thank you for inviting us for this very special uh, uh, night for us it's night time in Israel. Um, <clears throat> I would like to tell my own story in regard to Wilfred Israel but before that I would like to thank Nomi because without her and without her book I could not have made this film. Um, the, the, the film is based and inspired by her book. She was able to interview people in the late 70s that of course had died and until I've made this film in 2013 or 12, we have started it and we released it in 2017. So without the book, I could not have made, made this film. And so I'd like to thank her and Elan and all the good people that helped me to research um, this in, in order to be able to make this film. The name Wilfred Israel was part of my life ever since I remember myself. I grew up in, a, in Kibbutz Hazorea, uh, a beautiful kibbutz. Um, and in the center of this kibbutz, ever since I remember myself, there was a big house named the Wilfred's House. That's how the founders of the kibbutz uh, called this house. It's a house that, um, you know, it's very different and big and you cannot miss it. And all the kids in the kibbutz were playing baseball and soccer on its... Uh, a big uh, lawn, grass lawn uh, in front of it. So it was part of our story, but nobody told us who was Wilfred. 
And in the entrance to the Wilfrid Museum, there was only a sign that mentioned that he was a very uh, wealthy man who donated his incredible art collection to the kibbutz. And that's all we knew. And then in 2012, uh, Elon's brother, Ophir, came to me. I'm a filmmaker. So, you know, once or twice a week, somebody comes to me and says, you know, there is a great story for you that you must make a documentary about. And um, Ophir told me, I want to speak with you. There is a great story and you must make a documentary about it. And I was curious. I knew him. I knew Ophir from, from before. He was also growing up in this kibbutz. And he came to my office and he said, uh, what do you know about Wilfred Israel? And I said, well, Wilfred Israel from the Wilfred's house? And he said, yes. And I said, well, I know that he was a philanthropist, that he was a good friend of the founders of the kibbutz. This is something that my grandfather told me as well. My grandfather is the same age as uh, Elan's father. So he was among the founders of the kibbutz. And he told me, that Wilfred Israel was a good friend of the founders and that he had a lot of money and that he donated the art collection and that's it. And Ophir told me, and what if I would tell you that this man was involved in a saving of almost 20,000 people, um, which is 15 times more than Oscar Schindler. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense because if that would be the story, everybody would speak about it in the kibbutz, in Israel. It didn't make sense to me. And then Ophir handed the book of Nomi to me and asked me to flip it to the back cover of, of the book. And on the back cover of the book, there are two paragraphs. One of them is a quote by Martin Gilbert, Sir Martin Gilbert, one of the most important historians of the 20th century and the biographer of Winston Churchill and Martin Gilbert is writing in incredible, is incredible uh, um, feedback about this book, this research by Nomi Shepherd that was actually published in, 18, in 1983 uh, in English or 1984. So. And, that was, and that was already for me like, okay, if Martin Gilbert said that it's a great book, I should read it. But then uh, I, um, I, I saw the other paragraph and this, in this paragraph, I was even more amazed because what was written there was one sentence, never in my life have I come in contact with a being so noble, as strong and as selfless as Wilfred Israel. And underneath that, Albert Einstein. And I was thinking to myself, okay, if this is what Albert Einstein, this is what this incredible man was thinking about Wilfred Israel, I should definitely read the book. And then I read the book and it's amazing. And I started to ask myself, how come nobody speak about, nobody spoke about it in the kibbutz? How, about it, how come nobody spoke about it in Israel for so many years? And after, after the book was, um, released and praised by such important historians, it still didn't become part of the collective memory of the Holocaust in Israel. And then I went to the archives of the kibbutz and I found these boxes full of letters from people like Martin Buber and Albert Einstein and Heim Weizmann and Moshe Sharet and Thomas Mann and Lord Herbert Samuel and Siegfried Lehmann and people that I knew, you know, important figures, all of them are writing incredible things about Wilfred Israel, but nobody was speaking about him. And that was the reason for me to start to make this um, research and to start to make this film. I wanted to understand, to answer this question for myself. After six years of you know, working on this film, I think that I have my own answers to these questions, why his story was kept untold for so many years, after, even after Nomi's Shepherd was released, it, he did not become an important figure in Israel or somebody that people know about. And the two answers that I found was that 
first of all, when you are involved in saving of so many people from Nazi Germany in the 30s, you don't do it, you know, you don't save people from, from, from Nazi Germany in the 30s using a hand grenade and a machine gun. You don't fight them. You have to communicate with them. You have to communicate with the people that are in charge of the arbors, of the trains, of the visas, of the banks. You have to speak to the, to the authorities and the authorities were the Nazi administration. Now in Israel, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, anyone that spoke with the Nazis was regarded as a betrayer. And we all know the story of Kastner, which is very, very different, of course. But if I would be a friend of Wolf at Israel, knowing all that he has done, but knowing also that he had to communicate, negotiate, bribe the Nazi administration, and he died in 1943, I I'm not sure that I would speak about him openly because the way that he um, saved all these Jews um, has to go through the Nazi authorities. He had to communicate with them. And that was almost a taboo in Israel for many, many years. The second reason for me why his story was kept untold is that, you know, when we look at our own heroes in Israel, our own uh, heroes, people like Hannah Senesh or Mordechai Anilevich, and you look at what they did and what they didn't do, then you realize that these people, the heroes that we have in Israel, first of all, they did not speak with the Nazis. They fought them, opposite of Wilfried. Wilfried was um, um, working in a way that you know helped him save Jews, like I said before, by communicating with them, by negotiating with them, and by understanding their interest and doing what it needs, what needs to be done in order to save Jews. The second reason is that Mordechai Nilevich and Hannah Senesh never saved the soul. They never saved, saved anyone. And when you are in charge of the Hilfsverein, which is an organization that received about 2,000 uh, uh, requests per day after Kristallnacht for visas and uh, um, uh, other uh, certificates to, to leave Germany, a person like Wilfred Israel had to also say no to people and had to also prioritize. And you can see it in the film as well, if you watch the film, how in the end of the film, I find out that the members of the kibbutz themselves had to prioritize uh, the um, emigration of their own parents from Germany because there were not enough, uh, as Nomi said before, there were not enough countries to accept refugees. In Germany, we had about 530,000 Jews in 1933. 200,000 of, 200, of them uh, were, uh, left, were left in, in, in Germany and died in the Holocaust. So there is this term in psychology, survivor's guilt. But I think in Wilfred's case, it's also the rescuer's guilt. You know, you could not save everyone. And that's very, very, very difficult to someone to leave knowing that he did not, he were not able to save everyone that he wanted to save. I think this is maybe the biggest pain that Wilfred Israel had, uh, even in his letter in his letters, he's writing to his friends in the kibbutz, please keep the story secret. Uh, we'll have to take this story with us and to carry, carry this pain in silence. Um, I also think that if I would be a member in the kibbutz and my parents were, let's say, rescued by Wilfred Israel, but my neighbor's parents, he was not able to, to help them, then I don't think that I would, you know, walk around and say how great this man was because for my parents, he was an angel. But for my friend's parents, 
he could have been the, the angel that saved them, but he couldn't, could not save them. And then when you're living in a small community, uh, you have to be um, very sensitive about it. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, the story of Wolf of Israel was kept untold in the kibbutz and also in Israel. I also have to say that this thing is changing. In recent years, um, for the first time, Yad Vashem, uh, the Jewish authority for, for the memory of the Holocaust, um, have recognized for the first time Jews who saved Jews, uh, because in the past it was also, you had to be non-Jew in order to become a righteous among the, the nations. But if, since 2020, uh, there is some kind of recognitions, recognition for Jews who saved Jews. And Wilfred Israel is definitely uh, the Jew who saved more Jews than any, any other, uh, than any other Jew. And one of the main reasons for that is, of course, the department store and the fact that it was um, uh, registered and also um, uh, insured, heavily insured in England. So the Nazi administration, even though they persecuted Wilfred himself, they could not shut down this huge business, uh, which became an, a rescue operation, a home for rescue operation until um, April 1939. So basically you can say that in the late 30s, Wolfred Israel had a very, very, very unique position, being able to speak with his friends from, um, from England, being able to speak with his friend from the Zionist uh, 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 movement, and also being able to speak with the Nazi administration to bribe them and to do whatever needs to, um, um, to rescue as many people as possible. So that's a bit about my point of view in regard to Wilfred Israel and why his story was uh, forgotten for so many years. Thank you, Yonatan, and thank you, speakers. So we will get to audience questions in just a few moments. I just want to point out that the organization that uh, rescue that recognizes Jewish rescuers is actually not Yad Vashem, but the B'nai B'rith, and that is uh, what Ilan Baer is very involved in. So maybe in the Q&A, Ilan, you can speak about that. But right now, I want to tell you about what we have upcoming in the Sousa Mendes Foundation. So our next program takes us to France, to the town of Lille, France, which is near the Belgian border. And there, there was a rescue story that has just recently come to light. Uh, and uh, so it's a new film uh, about railway workers in France who did a spontaneous rescue action on September 11th, 1942, when suddenly there was the deportation of the Jews of Lille. And these deportees were brought to the train tracks and these, these railway workers understood what was happening and they started extracting these Jewish children mostly one by one and taking them to safety right under the noses of the Gestapo. It's pretty remarkable as a story. And um, so that's what we have upcoming for you next. And in a moment, we will see a trailer, but let me tell you what we have upcoming after that. So, we have been doing these programs on a two week basis. Instead of every week, we're doing every two weeks. What we're doing after the Lille story is we're showing you a five part documentary series all about our hero, Aristides de Souza Mendes. This is a fantastic series that was done for Portuguese television. It has English subtitles. Our foundation, the Sousa Mendes Foundation, was very deeply involved in the making of this series. So we're going to be dropping one episode a week and having a program every two weeks. So even if you've seen other films about Sousa Mendes, I really urge you to sign up for this because the films are really well done. So right now we're going to see a little trailer for the film, uh, Sauvons les enfants, We Must Save the Children. On Friday, September 11th, 1942, in occupied northern France, hundreds of Jews had been arrested, gathered at Lillefive Station, then deported to the Nazi death camps. 
Nothing remains of that station today, and the history of the site was very nearly forgotten too. But a station master's report was found in an antique dealer's boxes at Wazem Market in Lille. The few documents say that rail workers and local residents risk their lives to evade the German strict surveillance to save 40 people, most of them children, from deportation. It was one of the biggest rescues of Jews who were being sent to Auschwitz. What happened that day? How could such an event be so little known? Haunted by these questions, I set out to track down the traces of September 11th, 1942. So now I'd like to turn the floor over to Jack Newborn for the Q&A, and I would like to urge our audience to stay just a few minutes after the hour, because I think we're going to run over a little bit. So Judd, take us to the Q&A, please. Okay, well, along with the Q&A, we have some slides, uh, and it would be good to show a little bit of a little bit of that. So let's see a little more visual things. Um, the first slide is a slide of Wilfred's partners in rescue. There you see Frank Foley and Hubert Pollack. And Naomi, can you tell us more about how these three men, including Wilfred, worked together in, for the kinder transport operation and any other efforts they made? How did they actually manage the operation? Naomi? Uh, well, we know that Foley, uh actually uh, was operative in getting certificates for Palestine. Uh, I don't think he was particularly involved in the kinder transport uh, operation. The complicated relationship between the men was this. Um, Foley was in any case uh, through Wilfred Israel and Apart from that, Wilfred Israel, he was very sympathetic to the Jews. He was the head of uh, British intelligence in uh, in Germany. Uh, his actual role, official role of passport officer, uh, of uh, consular official, was only a cover. Um, he was supplying much information to uh, MI6 in London. And I think that probably he got a lot of information from Wilfred Israel as well. Uh, in uh, Jonathan's film, uh, there is evidence of this also. Uh, he, um, uh, Wilfred Israel was able, for instance, to tell him uh, who of the applicants for visas were actually Gestapo implants, because uh, that was going to happen. The Gestapo certainly knew uh, what Foley was doing, and they tried to, to find out as much as they could about it. Um, uh, the relationship with Polak uh, is unfortunately incomplete. It's tragic that Polak uh, swore an absolute vow of secrecy, secrecy to uh, Wilfred and refused, even after Wilfred's death, to, uh, to say more than he did. All he said was he was in touch with various uh, intelligence agents. Obviously, one of them was Foley. Uh, but I think uh, uh, the main reason why a lot of this has remained uh, under wraps, as, as uh, 
as Jonathan has said, the idea of uh, collaborating in any way with the Nazis was, uh, after the war, absolutely uh, suspect and uh, deplorable. And Wilfred Israel, through Polak, undoubtedly bribed, heavily bribed the Gestapo officials, uh, possibly even the head of the Saxon house in a uh, concentration camp. And uh, as we know, Wilfred used uh, the money from the firm, he ran it into the ground, basically, and uh, his own money as well. Uh, and, uh, and that had to be kept under wraps. So this trio of Foley helping with certificates, most specifically for Palestine, in, uh, in uh, return for Wilfred Israel's advice and his knowledge uh, of Germany. Uh, Foley had also been in Germany for years and years, but he needed more knowledge, the kind of knowledge which only a German and a German Jew would have had. And uh, unfortunately, we don't know enough about what Polik was doing, but I think we can assume uh, that uh, a lot of money changed hands. Okay, well, let's look at another slide, and I have a question or a couple to go with it. It's the slide of the department store itself. Um, what I'd like to know is, um, first of all, something more about Wilfred's character um, in the family. Um, Ilan said that he was philanthropic from the start, but I'm wondering, in this great business, um, his why did his father give him that role of being basically uh, probably a much better human resources uh, officer than we have today in corporations? And whether his homosexuality, which is barely discussed and which he basically kept secret, I suppose, does that have any bearing on his character? Did it uh, make him more sympathetic to uh, the oppressed or the persecuted? Did having to lead a double life, a secret life, make him particularly good at uh, espionage and secret uh, operations? So that's for anyone who wants to answer. Well, well I, I, yes, go ahead. Let's have your Natan. Well, I'll just say that, you know, um, first of all, his father died in 1936, if I'm not wrong. So after that, and his brother, Herbert, um, uh, left, uh, left Germany. Um, and so he basically stayed there alone. I think that the fact that he was a homosexual uh, contributed a lot to his ability to uh, operate like he operated. First of all, he was, um, he had this secrecy in him. He knew how to keep secret. He knew how to operate uh, um, under the radar. Um, and I also think that the fact that he had no children um, added a lot because he, he, he did not have a direct family, direct children to take care of, to take them out of Germany and to think about them. So in my view, you know, he felt like responsible for many children because he didn't have his own children. So I do think that his uh, homosexuality had played an important role in, in the fact that he was able to do what he was doing. Um, and yeah, and Christopher Isherwood, as you mentioned, uh, wrote about him and wrote about his homosexuality actually in two books, in Goodbye to Berlin, but also in Christopher and His Kind from 1979. So, uh, and, and I mean, Goodbye to Berlin became later on Cabaret. So uh, uh, that at the end won six Oscars, if I'm not wrong. But you um, said that, if I can interrupt, you said that the portraits of, by Isherwood were misrepresentations and Isherwood later was uh, acknowledged that. Yeah, I didn't say that it was a misrepresentation. It was actually Christopher Isherwood that wrote in his book from 1979. He actually um, really asked for forgiveness from Wilfred Israel for not being able to see him as the hero that he was because he was angry at him 
because Wilfred uh, kept his homosexuality to himself and was not open about it. And that really um, made him angry in one way or the other. So that's why Christopher Isherwood in Goodbye to Berlin uh, wrote about Wilfred Israel, but not in a good way. But then in 79, in, uh, in uh, Christopher and his kind, in his later book, he was kind of um, saying, I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry for not being able to, to see the whole story because of, uh, because of his homosexuality uh, sexuality and because of the fact that he stayed in the closet, you know, it didn't come out. And that was something that uh, Christopher Isherwood was writing about. It, I think today with the enormous uh, backlash and uh, reactionary culture wars regarding uh, LGBTQ people here in the United States, at least, uh, it's important to add another uh, heroic figure to that uh, list of people who break stereotypes. Um, there was a, a resistance figure, a Dutch figure who was gay but not Jewish named Willem Orondias who was executed and before he was executed, he said, please let the world know that homosexuals can be heroic too. So I think that's important. And I, but of course, his life was so secretive, we wouldn't have known about uh, much, much about um, him. But tell me something else. Let's go to the picture since we don't have much time. There's a, there's a slide that shows the last picture taken of Wilfred Israel in Lisbon in 1943, shortly before Yes, that picture. Um, can you tell me? Yeah, it's, Lisbon. Lisbon. it's in yes. Lisbon. Yes, someone asked in the group, um, he, he was supposed to have uh, secured 600 visas for young Jews in, Pal in Germany to get to Palestine. And the question was, did he manage actually to make that happen? Did those 600 uh, get those visas? Were they rescued? Does anyone well, know? So first of all, okay, go ahead, Elon, go ahead. I think he did in the book that Naomi wrote, it is described that he had a lot of connections with many people during this time, of two months in uh, Portugal and Spain. And we don't know exactly, but I think he found many people that he probably gave them the certificates, but he didn't have the time to send them really. And when he was killed, there came after him, uh, Peretz, uh, I don't remember the second name, but someone who took his place. And a few months later, he could send them in the, with the ship Nyasa, and the first one who could uh, go through the Mediterranean that, that, that earlier was very dangerous because of the uh, submarines of the Nazis. And, uh, and so most of the people that he, he contacted and he probably provided them the certificates went with this uh, with this uh, ship and afterwards came others. And uh, this is, th there was a, a going on of his mission. So what he couldn't accomplish, uh, the one who followed him, Peretz Lichtstein or something like that, he did it, but he just, uh, just went on with what Wilfred um, provided and uh, did. And there are very, very, um, there are letters from people that he spoke with them in those days in the, in the villages on the shore of Lisbon, that he really found, found his way to the people and to encourage them to find those who are, who are very desperate and he gave them he gave them again an aim and a seal and could, could encourage them to go to Israel and help with the new state. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, people are staying with us. We have just a few more questions that I must try to get in. One question, someone asked why in Berlin 
uh, on the site where um, the N Israel uh, department store was, which is now apparently an insurance building, there was no plaque or mention of him, which seems a, a terrible omission. And yet, Naomi, I think you have an answer to how he has been recognized in Germany. Could you speak to that, Naomi? Uh, yes, uh, apart from the fact that the book was translated into German and uh, reviewed very widely. Um, the uh, Wilfred Israel's home was in the Bendlerstrasse, which was not far from the firm. And there is what's called a Stolperstein, a stumbling stone, uh, one of uh, thousands which are put up uh, in Germany to commemorate people who lost their lives, Jews who were, who were killed by the Nazis. And uh, that is a form of commemoration. And the, the, the stone has his name, uh, the dates of his birth and death, and uh, the, uh, the inscription says, uh, Wilfred Israel, savior of children. I'd like to say that at least until a few years ago, there were not only one plaque, but actually two plaques right in front of the Rotes Rathaus, uh, the center of the center of Berlin, where the N Israel department, stood, uh, uh, department store stood. There were two plaques, one for Wilfred Israel himself as an individual, and the other one is was for the building for the N Israel store. So, and there are other places where the the uh, that they um um they have um some some uh, plaques in 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 uh, Schwanenwerder where where Israel uh, Wilfred Israel has a house. There is another uh, big thing that mention his his name and his story. I think it becomes part of the of the of the collective memory also in Germany in recent years and even in Israel there is now a city Natania who has decided to uh, um, um, to call a street after his name so it's changing and that's good and I would like to say also that we are going to open in Hazorea in Wilfred Israel Museum inside we got a place and we are going hopefully at the near September to open a center for the memory of Jews who rescued Jews so that groups and people will come and know more and more about them personally and as a, a group, as a, yes. a, something that was, a, maybe one more sentence, what Jonathan said about why didn't uh, Israel um, give this acknowledge many years ago, it was also because of not, not uh, accepting uh, uh, contact with the Nazis, but it was also that Israel, the ethos of Israel building was with a state and with a military, we defend ourselves against everybody who would like to exterminate us. And so there was no place at those many years to give the acknowledgement to people who did save thousands and thousands yes. of people without weapon. Right, and now you're- By dedicating themselves in many, many yes. ways to save people. And That's that is what now in the last years is coming inside uh, to be more and more accepted that not only those who took weapon into their hands, but also so many who rest, risked yes. their lives and lost their lives yes. to save others without weapons. Yes, I, thank you. Events. Thank you, Ilan. We're going to have to finish up now. And I think those are fitting ways to end the program and final thoughts, as well as Naomi's comment that we really have to remember that refugees are at risk today. And now Olivia will sign us off. Thank you to our panel and our moderator, my friend Judd Newborn. Thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Be well. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. See you next time. Bye -bye. Thank you.